Arthur and Harper. And your dates of birth? Uh, the 13th of March, 1931. Were you born in Half Bay? No, I wasn't. I was born in the UK, um, but I came to Africa in 1960 to teach in Zambia, in Lusaka. And um, that's what, I met my husband there, and then we went down to Amtata. We were in Amtata for about 12 years. He was diocesan secretary there for the Anglican Church. And then we moved to Cape Town in 1983. And we've been in Hout Bay ever since 1983. So it's quite a long time. <laughs> but what? my first visit, visit to Hout Bay was in 1960 when I came down on holiday and um, did a bus tour. And I think there was a black southeaster on here. And I thought, what a terrible place it looked. <laughs> It was the most forbidding place in the whole place. Little did I know that I would be living here eventually. <laughs> what made you decide to move to Harper? Well, it was because my husband uh, got the job. Uh, he was then became the diocesan secretary of um, Cape, uh, Prov uh, the, the Cape, Down, Cape Down Diocese. And that was uh, when Archbishop Desmond Tutu was also uh, uh, Archbishop at the time. So it was quite an interesting time, and uh, he did that work for about 12 years, I think, and then retired. Were you still teaching at that stage? No, um, I wasn't. I, I um, taught in England for a time, then I taught in, in Lusaka, and then I did little secretarial jobs in <coughs> Tata, whatever needed to be done, which was quite a few different things, like being... Was it secretary treasurer of the Mothers' Union at one stage, and, and also um, dealing with some conferences and taking the notes and things. You know, just because I had a family then, the, the children were small, so I could do those things sort of part-time. Um, and then when I came to Cape Town, I also got a little job, part-time office job. And then um, uh, St. Cyprian's School... Uh, it was when they changed onto the manual typewriter, the um, automatic electronic typewriters, and uh, they had appointed another teacher because the, the old one had left, and the new one didn't arrive. And my daughter, who knew somebody who was in the typing class and was desperate for a teacher, rang me up and said, um, Mom, there's a job for you. So I rang them up and I said, I, well, I am a teacher and I can type. Can I help you out for a couple of weeks? And I was there for eight years <laughs> and ended up teaching business economics as well. But that was, uh, you know, that was how, how that went. And then I retired about 20-something years ago, 22 years ago. So it's quite a long time ago. Tell me, when your husband was, um, what was his involvement in the community specifically here in Hart Bay? In Hart Bay? Well, here he, he was actually treasurer, I think, for the Hart Bay and Landudna Association, which was the organisation that actually got this spinny retirement village um, off the ground and built, um, because this property belonged to the Staines, not the, he was the dairy farmer, and then he died, and then I think um, they gave the land for the, um, the, the village to be built for the supposedly less affluent of Hawaii, but of course every price has gone up these days, so it's not exactly for less affluent. But um, that was what he did, um, I think, during his working time and after he retired for a, a time, and then, then we came here to live. We used to live in Empire Avenue, right this end, uh, with plenty of sand blowing around. I mean, it's not quite as bad as it is now, because it's terrible now. But uh, we were at number eight, and uh, we had a few encounters with the sa and sand dune across the garden. <laughs> anyway, you know, we survived that. Uh, we were in that house for about 17 years, I think, and we've been here. I've been here now since 2000. So that's going up to 17 years as well. So I'm curious now, the first time that you visited Hart Bay. Yes. What do you remember about what it looked like back then and where did you stay? Well, I was on this little bus tour, you know, so I was staying in a place in, in Cape Town, um, a, a little hotel. In fact, I came down from, um, from Zambia, that was in those days, and uh, I can remember 
walking somewhere round by the castle. I think the sea was still by the castle. So, yeah, this is 1966 at Christmas. But um, all I can remember about Hart Bay at that time was how grim it looked because of this black southeaster. <laughs> it was, the, you know, as far as I was concerned, it looked the most um, forbidding part of the whole of the Cape Peninsula. But I don't remember much else about Hart Bay then. But of course, I suppose um, we probably didn't stop if it was blowing a southeaster, so we didn't have a chance to look at how the shore was or anything like that. When we arrived here, um, they were just making Victoria Avenue. So all the buses and cars came down Empire Avenue. And quite soon we lost our kitten because it got run over. But that was rather a tragedy that was in our very early days there. But um, anyway, we uh, survived that all right. <laughs> and that was sort of early 80s, how else? Has it changed since then? Well, of course, uh, in those days it was a very small population and there weren't so many shops. Um, I think there was the uh, Laughing Lobster was one and the pa Pastry Man. And I can remember they, the Pastry Man had a crocodile pie-eating competition, which <laughs> was qu quite revolting. I think the winner ate 13 quite large crocodile pies. <laughs> Because with the children being quite young, we went to watch any show that happened to be going on. We watched this going on. <laughs> and um, there was one little shop this side. This is somebody, I forget her name, a little supermarket down here. And of course there was the post office and um, a few, um, what was it called? It was a little, um, not, not uh, the one that became uh, First National Bank, I think, one of those forget the name of it. Um, but, it, you know, we were quite small as far as shopping was concerned, and you had to go somewhere else if you wanted to find a variety of things. But it was uh, very nice uh, for the young people, you know, because there was a, a youth club, and, um, well, it was a Christian youth club, and, and uh, they all got to know each other very, very well. And um, those friends that they made, I think they've kept up with. It was, a, it was a very nice time for them. But you could just walk down to the beach, you know, it was easy to get through from the end of Empire Avenue and straight onto the shore. And there were the fishermen with their nets bringing in the fish. And um, so it, it was a very um, homely time. And there would be a a foghorn going if there was mist, you know, it was, I don't think they have that now. Um, but it was just quite a, a rural place and a very small population. And of course it's grown tremendously. But we used to have also um, in the harbour, um, they had the blessing of the fishing boats, you know, and a, a band there would be, and a little ceremony, and... Um, then uh, sometimes it, they would have everybody on the on the trawlers and have a little trip out to Seal Island and the trawlers would race each other, you know. It was all great fun, that was. But, of course, there's too many people now. It's so full of people and the harbour is always crowded out, so I don't think they do that. When was that done specifically, the blessing of the boats? Well, I think from the time we got here, which was 83... I can't tell you when it stopped, but it seemed to go on for quite a few years. But was there like a specific season or what? Um, I suppose there was, and I can't remember exactly when it was. Probably somebody in the harbour will tell you. I mean, maybe it's the snook. Is there a season for snook? I think mm. that would be um, just before that started, probably then. Okay. And um, and were there, were there like bazaars or any kind of community events? Um, community events, and let me just think. Uh, Dances? No, I don't think so. They used to, there was talk of they used to have dances under the Milkwoods on that corner. Um, apparently one time they used to bring a sort of slatted floor that they could lay down on the ground and then they'd have dances under the Milkwoods in that corner by the post office. Um, but that was before my time. But we used to go down there, they used to have the fishermen's cottages, and we had a, 
Bible study. Some a group of ladies used to go down there um, to Yvonne Knowles' house. Um, and I think her husband was a fisherman, and we used to go, and there would be all the lobster pot things piled up, you know, and it was very rural under the trees there before they built the mainstream. And then, of course, that all got cleared away. Um, yes, and the other thing, which was before my time, but they, they said that one time the, the river came down from the mountain, you know, in a lot of rain, and washed the road away. Um, and that must have been uh, quite, quite a, a, a strange thing to happen. But have you heard about that? No. No, because that um, was some great storm. That was uh, the Little River, you know, not the, not, not the Dyser River, the tributary that goes into it. Um, so, you know, there's been quite a few things in the past that I've heard about, but I wasn't here for. But the, um, the, the big event that really happened was the uh, when they started building up the the mountain sides um well the first thing they they started selling plots up there and there was a very wet winter i think it was about 1986 or seven something like that maybe a bit before but um we we drove around to have a look and see what's going on and that little river that there's a little river that runs there and all the sides were falling in because of so much water and we drove around where we saw on one corner plot for sale and there's a waterfall coming down <laughs> so we wondered whoever bought that property they'd have a little bit of a job to sort that out um but anyway that um the building of course displaced certain people who'd been living in the bushes because there were workers who I think worked in the harbour and on the boats and that who used to camp in the bushes and um, we would occasionally see a little plume of smoke going up out of the bushes you know but when they built then they were displaced and some of the people uh, came uh, to just trying to think where they start. They came to camp out, you know, make their little shacks somewhere by the river and then, of course, on the dunes. But we were on uh, Empire Avenue, um, the first corner back. Uh, we had no wall or anything like that, and these people needed water. So there were a few of them, you know. And, of course, we had come from Antarctica where we'd had... People, well, those Nyanga squatters were deposited. We lived by the church, by the cathedral there. And um, they they were brought up by buses, the Nyanga squatters. Do you remember that they were brought from Cape Town back to the Trans Sky because mm -hmm. they didn't want them down here? So they dumped them at the church on a wet winter evening and they came into the church hall and they lived there for quite a long time until I can't remember how, what exactly organised, but there was there for several weeks. And so we got to, you know, to know these people and that the, they needed certain things. Mm -hmm. So when there were people, they came, could they have some water? I, I said, yes, but there were about 10 of them at first. <laughs> And we, our tap was in the garden, you know. Well, of course, by the time that it was all sorted out, there were hundreds of them, and the garden was trampled to bits, and they'd had lots of water. But, of course, it was rather unpleasant because some of the neighbours didn't like this. And, I mean, we felt, first of all, that the, the water should have been provided. I mean, the people were there. Everybody's complaining about their, you know, the health hazards and all that, but nobody provided water. Nobody provided uh, portable toilets or anything like that. They were just li living there. And um, they've got to have water. And, and, you know, it says in the Bible, if you give a cup of water to somebody, well, that's what you should do. So we did it. And uh, as I say, it did escalate over time. But it had to be done. But one time, um, somebody threw a stone through my son's bedroom window, you know, as a protest. And um, we also somebody put a, a bag of some dog's toy, uh, poos or something in the garden. You know, the whole thing was a bit unpleasant. It gave my son quite a nasty turn because he was not very old at the time. Um, but, you know, mm. that was resistance from one or two of the diehard neighbours. Mm. Most people were quite 
um, willing. And Paddy Haslow, who was living around the corner, she also, they were getting water from her as well. But they had to have water. Well, how can you not have? And the thing that really shocked me was after some time, a circus came, and that was that big car park, you know, which there's not that you, I don't know if you know, but it was a big car park to, for the beach. And the circus set up there, and lo and behold, there was a tap, you know, they connected up a tap for the circus. So the circus got water, and of course everybody could get water there. That was lovely. I thought, oh, good. <laughs> Garden perhaps can re rehabilitate. But um, when the circus left, somebody took the tap away again, and, but, you know, it was buried underground, I suppose, or whatever. Mm. And so it was back to square one. And I could not understand how people can just leave, I mean, hundreds of people there was by this time without... Um, an official oh, source of water and some toilet facilities, whatever. Anyway, they were camping by the river and they were camping on the beach and the dunes and um, that went on. I can't remember how long it went on for, but it went on for quite a long time until they um, opened up the forestry land. And then, of course, that was a bit of a shambles because the people that were originally here I don't think many of them got their plots of land that they were supposed to be getting. They seemed to go to the wrong people, but more people kept coming in, and so it goes on, you know. But that's how 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 has grown. So that's where Imi Tomayetu is now. Yes, okay. yes. Well, that's a lot of that is forestry land, um, but then I think they've extended up the mountain as well a lot up to Tomsiyaki. Um, but, you know, it, how they have grown. And it's been quite interesting to um, see how everybody's adapting. You know? mm. I mean, but the roads are not adapting. That's the big problem because mm. uh, the traffic is terrible. Mm -hmm. And this is Constantia Neck I mean, is, is, is awful. Um, and everybody's building more, more properties, so there's more cars. And uh, I don't know how we're going to manage uh, when all these uh, new places get their inhabitants. I was just wondering, in the 80s, uh, what was the main employment or employers here in Heart Bay? In, in Heart Bay? Well, of course, the harbour and the fisheries, um, that was one of the main, and the fish factories. And um, then, of course, all the local... There were local businesses, but everything has expanded tremendously. And, you know, restaurants and tourism and so on, as they've built more more properties um, and more, sh well, the shopping centres and everything. Um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, some people worked in town, I suppose. There wasn't um, so much going on, but there, was, there were the factories in the harbour, and I think there's not as many now as there were. I think some of them have closed. There used to be a Woolworths food factory there, and I don't think that's there now. That was called, um, what was it called? I can't, I can't remember, but I know we used to be able to go down and get the sort of over oversupplied things for cheap prices. You know, that was quite a nice thing to do, but uh, that stopped. Uh, how long have you been involved with the museum? When I first came here, they asked me to go to a committee meeting, and that's in 83, end of 83, maybe the beginning of 84, because we were in Cape Town for a few months before we, we had to actually build our house here, when we, well, get it built. Um, but I, they asked me to go to the committee meeting, and then when they... And when they got me there, they, it turned out the treasurer had resigned. <laughs> and would, would I please be the treasurer? So I had to take that on. And I did that until I got my teaching job. And then I gave it up for a few years. And then when I stopped that, um, the lady that was doing it then, was uh, she was pleased to hand it back over. So I got it back again uh, for some years. And now I've given it over to Regine Williams. She's now the treasurer of the Friends, that is, of the Friends. 
uh, I've been involved. I'm still on the tr on the uh, committee for the Friends. So you must have learned quite a bit of local history. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Yes, well, I mean, all the... Um, the because they've done things like reenacting the Battle of Hout Bay. Um, have you heard about that? No. Because the heritage people, um, they organised a, a boat to come into the bay, you know, and then they got all the children on the beach holding hands to be the defenders against this boat, you know, and then the cannons would go off and all that. Um, have you heard about the cannons? You, are you seeing Dave Cowley? I don't know. Because that's a very important... I mean, this the cannons and the um, Heritage Trust, they all put on their uniforms as if 1810 or something like that, you know, very early days, uniforms. And uh, whenever there's a chance, they make, there's a ceremony, <laughs> then they will be there and fire off the guns. And, uh, you know, it's it's a great feature of Hart Bay, that is. Uh, but Do you know anything about the bowling of Chapman's Peak? Did you come across anything on that? Um, well, I know that it was around about 1927, wasn't it? Um, but I can't tell you many details. I know in the museum they've got these uh, a little wall made out of rocks, which the, some of the I think the convicts who made it they they chiselled their names on, and so they, in the museum they've got they when they uh, reconstructed the road, then they took these stones that have got the names and made it into a little wall as a sort of memorial of these these uh, people that had contributed. But Chapman's Peak, when we first came, of course, was just natural. It wasn't um, built up at all. And it was wonderful, I, you know. And we used to be taken by the museum, they, uh, Pan Wormsa, who was the curator, to take us down to have a look where the geology has, you know, shifted and you've got the lines of sandstone that go up and down and, and all that, and showed us the little spring on the side of the wall and all that which is, I found fascinating. But um, now it's so busy, you can't hardly look at anything like that. And, uh, you know, you could just go as far as you wanted to, people would walk through or you could drive through. Now it's, it's I mean, I've, I personally felt very um, cheated when they, they made us pay for that road because, I mean, Hart Bay, it's, our, it's our, you know, our environment, you know, and it's the place where we used to go to to have picnics and, and visit over to Nordhook mm. easily. And now you, you can't do that. I mean, it's very expensive. It's about 40 rand or something one way. And um, there's a little bit of a problem about this, closing it down at sunset or that if you're there after sunset, mm. you have to pay. Well, I mean... You know, people go to watch the sun go down, and, and that's one of the things that we used to do. You wouldn't expect to have to pay for that. Because it's, it's like our park, you know, mm. our, our personal town park. And um, that's been, you know, really cut off from us. And, uh, of course, Constantia there, I mean, there's nothing that way because it's all so busy. And the coast road is also pretty busy, so, you know, we, we just feel a bit sad. But uh, there were times when we were down to one exit road here because um, Chapman's Peak sometimes got closed because of mm. rock falls. And um, the coast road, at one stage, the mountainside was sliding down. Um, so the road was very narrow they had to do a lot of work to stop the mountains coming coming down they took i think a, a, you know with that wall they've got now a wall sort of thing with things growing mm. in it and all behind there they took a lot of earth away that was soft and likely to slide because just there there was very little room to get by for quite a long time sure. and so that road was a bit dicey too and of course then Constantia Neck if there's ever an accident on Constantia Neck that closes up too so we were in a bit of a difficult position in fact I mean we could still be in a difficult position the same thing could happen again and they've talked about putting a high level road by Constantia Neck so that you go up one side and down the other mm. 
but we believe that when we see it. They've talked about it for 30, 30 years, <laughs> and it hasn't happened yet, uh, so I don't know whether it ever will. But um, So where were those picnic spots that you were talking about? Uh, Long Chapman's Peak Drive, you know, there are a lot of little inlets and car parks and places like that where you could just go and edit anywhere you liked. And even up to the lookout point, I mean, you, that's beyond where you should be going to now. And it's, um, it's quite restrictive, I think. And of course, it was nice to go through to Nordhook. And if you wanted to go to Fishhook, that was the quick way to go. But it, then if you have to pay 40 rand each way, it's, uh, you think twice about it. I don't go that way at all now, unless I have a visitor. I sometimes mm. want to take a visitor to see the, um, the view. But otherwise, I think, well, I, I'd rather save my money. <laughs> Are there any other local history stories that you um, would like to share? I'm just trying to think now. <clears throat> uh, Well, I think that the museum, I mean, that we've, we've had guided walks for well, ever since I've been here. And it's one way that it was lovely to find out all about the countryside because, you know, you could go off in a group. But of course, lately it's become very difficult because of, um, well, one thing is uh, there have been muggings from time to time. But there's also a lot more hiking groups, I think, that organise themselves. And... Um, so the museum at the moment, we're just wondering what to do about walks because also some of the walk leaders have grown old and passed on or you know they're not able to do it anymore. But um, those walks were a great joy. You know, you'd have about 12 or 14 people and you'd go and explore this part or the other part. And sometimes we'd go out to... Um, Musenberg or somewhere like that as well for the walks. And they were very, very good and helpful. Um, but I think nowadays people don't... Well, they either organise themselves for a, a big walk or, or, you know, what is it? There's some various um, hiking groups that are very, I suppose, more um, sort of... Uh, no, less, less informal than we were. We were quite informal, mm -hmm. but we found that it has been difficult now. Yeah. And um, but they were very good at the time. Yes. And uh, I was trying to think of anything else that to talk about. That um, you found very interesting about the history of Hart Bay. Yes. Well, of course, one of the museum walks was to take people up the little roads. Um, where the old houses were, where the harbour master used to live, and, and the, those sort of places, and hear about. Um, and there's uh, um, the, um, what's the name? Um, what's the name of the road over there with the uh, Indian um, battle name, uh, the regiment name? Oh, goodness me, it's gone out of my head. Uh, but there's a little battery place uh, along there, you know, you can see where the, there used to be a little um, place where the, the army was. And then, of course, the uh, East Fort and the West Fort. Those uh, West Fort's been done up better, I think, lately. East Fort needs a bit of attention, I believe, although the cannons were um, redone and it made very nice... Um, so the fire made a big difference mm. when we had that fire in 2000, I think it was New Year, 2000, 2001, when we thought that Hart Bay was going to get burnt. I mean, it was really quite scary. And uh, all the population, the, you know, the able-bodied people were out helping to put it out. Mm -hmm. um, that, 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 of course, that was one of the things that caused Chapman's P to... Um, become dangerous because vegetation got burnt and then the rocks started falling and then I think people went to try and tidy it up a bit and pull down more rocks than they should have done and you know it is it's not the same my feeling is now it's it's it could be almost anywhere you know like in Europe you get these places with tunnels and so on and it's not like it used to be as a natural place